bubonic plague may cause lymph nodes, but mnemonic plague helps you to remember things. <laughs> Alrighty, as always, here's our clinical case. A 29-year-old woman comes to your office because of palpable non-tender cervical lymph adenopathy. Hmm, that is not resolved after one month, and uh, she has intermittent night sweats, but otherwise nice any symptoms. She has no history of any other medical conditions. Physical exam is within normal limits. A full blood count and comprehensive metabolic panel are normal. However, a CT scan demonstrates pathologically enlarged lymph nodes. That's where the money is, guys. In the neck, axilla, and mediastinum. A subsequent positron emission tomography CT scan, otherwise affectionately termed a PET scan, demonstrate that these are fluorodeoxyglucose avid. So FDG avid, everybody. Alongside is a representative portion of the excisional biopsy demonstrating large cells with a bilobed nucleus. There we go. And prominent nucleoli surrounded by pleomorphic cellular infiltrate. Which of the following statements regarding this patient's diagnosis is true? Is it option A, that HTLV1, which is human T lymphotropic virus 1, is associated with development of this disease? Is it B, the existence of the T1418 mutation and abnormal expression of the BCL2 protein of confirmatory? Is it C, that the majority of patients will not be cured with chemotherapy alone? D, the PDL1 protein is often overexpressed and may contribute to immune invasion. Or is it D, that was rather E, sorry, the diseases of T cell origin? Hmm, I wonder. Okay, guys, a couple of points to note about our good friends, the lymph nodes. That normal lymph nodes may be felt in the axilla and the crane, up to 0.5 centimeters, and are usually shotty and rubbery. Uh, in the submandibular area, lymph nodes below 1 centimeter are normal in kidneys, and inguinal lymph nodes less than 2 cm are normal among adults. Reactive lymph nodes, which are often reactive to infection mainly, expand rapidly and may be painful. Localized lymph adenopathy means a single anatomical area of lymph node involvement. Now, when we use the term generalized lymph adenopathy, this simply means that we're referring to three or more anatomical non-contiguous areas of lymph node involvement. Enlargement of the supraclavicular and the scalene lymph nodes are always pathological. I'll say that again. Enlargement of the supraclavicular, especially if you have it on the left supraclavicular, which is called the Trousseau's node, um, which speaks to more often a GI malignancy. And the scalene nodes are always pathological. Okay. Okay, so what are the causes of generalized lymph adenopathy among kids? Hmm. So it can signify lymphoma, usually Hodgkin's lymphoma. It could be acute lymphoblastic leukemia or a viral infection. So you think about big groups, infectious, inflammatory, malignant, all right, infiltrative, right? And examples of viral infection are cytomegalovirus, CMV, and infectious mononucleosis, uh, which is caused by Epstein-Barr virus. Others to always bear in mind is TB, 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 disseminated TB, and SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. Here we have some beautiful pictures courtesy of short cases in clinical medicine by Prof. Abdullah and company. God bless you. Uh, There's an example of cervical lymphadenopathy. Here is a cold abscess which speaks to TB. Here is a scar mark of previous lymph node biopsy, and here a tuberculous sinus which is draining. Alrighty. Now, what are the causes of generalized lymph adenopathy among the middle aged to the elderly? So here we speak to lymphoma again. So once again, your groups, malignancies, especially of the lymphoreticular system. So you're talking about lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, lymphigature infectious causes. Once again, the two culprits, cytomegalovirus and infectious mononucleosis, disseminated TB features there as well. Then we think about infiltrative causes like sarcoidosis. Don't forget other infections like brucellosis, toxoplasmosis, HIV as well. Okay, you got a patient who has lymph adenopathy. What are the other relevant exam findings that you want to elicit? So look for hepatomegaly and splenomegaly, which may point to some malignancy of the hematological lymphoreticular system, like lymphoma and leukemia, right? Uh, if there's anemia together with bony tenderness, that points more to leukemia. If there's purpura or bruising and petechiae, 
you're thinking about leukemia because of infiltration of the bone marrow that can't push out platelets and you have bleeding tendencies, right? If the patient has palatal petechial hemorrhage that points to infectious mononucleosis, which we said is caused by our good friend EBV, Epstein-Barr. If the patient has cachexia, generalized wasting, together with constitutional symptoms of fever, night sweats, loss of appetite, loss of weight, the usuals, then that points to disseminated TB or it could be secondary malignancy coming from elsewhere. Okay, one of the causes of generalized lymphadenopathy with arthritis. Mm. Well, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, otherwise affectionately termed Stills disease. Watch out for that. And a tip off there would be yo, hi, ferritin. Watch out for that. Systemic lupus erythematosus felti syndrome, which happens with rheumatoid arthritis, okay, which is a triad of rheumatoid arthritis, neutropenia, and splenomegaly. The patients often have ulcers as well. Sarcoidosis, we know, viral infections, once again, uh, infectious mononucleosis and cytomegalovirus and brucellosis. All of these cause generalized lymph adenopathy with some degree of arthritis. One of the causes of lymph adenopathy with splenomegaly and or hepatomegaly. So once again, your malignancies. Lymphoma, you can have acute uh, uh, lymphoblastic leukemia and chronic lymphatic leukemia. Uh, infectious mononucleosis, SLE, Felti syndrome, sarcoidosis, brucellosis, toxoplasmosis, disseminated TB and HIV. So you see, it's like a common, almost common recurrent theme among these different etiologies. All right. What are the causes of generalized lymph adenopathy with fever? Mm -hmm. So your viral infections once more, and a headline there will be infectious mononucleosis and cytomegalovirus, virus, lymphoma, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, disseminated TB, brucellosis, sarcoidosis, toxoplasmosis. Okay, let's talk about a diagnostic process now for generalized lymphadenopathy. So a patient presents to your clinic with generalized lymphadenopathy on examination, how are you going to proceed? So once again, the pillars of medicine, uh, history, physical exam, investigation, management. So in terms of history, you want to ascertain, is there a history of fever? Does the patient have loss of weight? If so, you want to quantify this in terms of uh, you know, a number of pounds or cages lost over a particular period of time, like three or six months, or whether the clothes are getting loose, all right, pants getting loose. What about uh, sweating and itching as well? Physical exam, you know, elicit that lymphadenopathy, determine whichever area it may be in. Hepatospinomegaly, rash, are there uh, joints involved in terms of arthritis? Then you want to investigate the patient. Right, the next golden question, how do you investigate generalized lymphadenopathy? So a good place to start would be with your uh, blood or your hematological investigations, do a full blood count with a differential, an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and you want to do a peripheral smear. Hmm, what are you doing a peripheral smear for? Well, to exclude leukemia. If you've got high eosinophils on the differential, that's a tip-off for Hodgkin's lymphoma. If you've got atypical lymphocytes, which points to infectious mononucleosis, Right, and a high lymphocyte sedimentation rate in TB. All right, sometimes you may also see blasts, which points to leukemia as well. All right, chest x ray for TB, 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 very prevalent in our setting. And of course, if you have bihyalin adenopathy, it could point to lymphoma or sarcoidosis or even lymphatic leukemia. It's also prudent to do an ultrasound or a CT of the abdomen looking for hepatosplenomegaly, which you may have missed clinically, and more lymph nodes, especially mediastinal and abdominal lymphadenopathy. And other investigations according to what you suspect may be going on. So if you suspect lymphoma, I think it's prudent for you to go forth and do a fine needle aspiration and send off for cytology or a formal excisional or incisional lymph node biopsy and send off for formal histology. If you suspect leukemia, it's a good idea to do a bone marrow aspirate and trephine. Right, and if it's disseminated TB that you think is high on the cards, it's good to do a MANTU test, a fine needle aspiration, or a biopsy. I think biopsy is the gold standard there. If HIV is suspected, you can do an HIV ELISA. Uh, if uh, SLE is suspected, it's good to do your serology in support of that. That's an anti nuclear factor, anti anti double standard DNA. Alrighty. 
So guys, coming back to our clinical case, we got a young a female who came into your office because of non-tender cervical lymph nodes. Uh, she has intermittent night sweats, but nothing else really in terms of her history. Her full blood count, comprehensive metabolic panel are normal, physical exam is normal, but the CT picked up that she has large nodes in the neck, axilla, and mediastinum, and a PET CT shows that these lymph nodes are FDG avid. And here she has the histology from the excisional biopsy of one of those lymph nodes showing our beloved Reed Sternberg cell with the bilobe nucleus and prominent nuclear old eye surrounded by a pleomorphic cellular infiltrate. So which of the following statements regarding her diagnosis is true? And of course, the answer is D, that the PD-R1 proteins often overexpress and may contribute to immune invasion. So show, as we know, it was a beloved Reed Sternberg cell, which is diagnostic for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And most of the patients with Hodgkin's will be cured with either chemotherapy alone or a combo of chemo with radiotherapy. Uh, which is also true of other lymphomas, including Burkitt's and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Epstein Barr virus is, of course, associated with development of Hodgkin's lymphoma. And interestingly, 97% of Hodgkin's Reed Sternberg cells in classic Hodgkin's lymphoma harbor genetic aberrations in the PDL1 locus on chromosome 9p24.1, resulting in overexpression of the PDL1 protein, which happens to be the ligand for the inhibitory PD1 receptor on immune cells. And this is the one mechanism in which the Hodgkin's Reed stomach cell may be able to avoid immune destruction in its inflammatory microenvironment and may contribute to generalized immune suppression among Hodgkin's patients. Okay, everybody, some encouragement for you today from the Bible. I want to talk about seeking after God. The Bible says, draw close to me and I will draw close to you. That's the book of James. John 4 verses 23 to 24, Jesus says, behold, a time is coming. Behold, a time is indeed coming and has now come, right, when the true worshippers uh, will worship the Father, how? In spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. Jeremiah 29, 13, the promise there is, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And I pray that will be the desire of our hearts, to seek the Lord, to know the Lord, to fellowship with the Lord, to have a passionate devotion to serving Him and knowing Him more and more every day. These are my references. God bless you. Thanks for listening to this uh, overview video. I'll see you another time with another video in internal medicine. God bless you. <music>